Professor Patricia Mohammed, Professor in Gender and Development Studies, Director of Graduate Studies and Research, Dr. Angelique Nixon, lecturer with the Institute of Gender and Development Studies and chair for this afternoon. Members of staff from the University of the West Indies, students, visitors, welcome to the Alma Jordan Library on behalf of the campus librarian and also the West Indian and Special Collections team. We are honored to have Professor Mohammed here delivering a lecture in our series, Insights into Our Treasures. We have been having this series over the past three years. And in the lecture series, we partner with faculty. We usually have two presenters who will use a collection or explore a theme in our collection. And we will have these two presenters provide us with different perspectives on the collection. Today is different. We have one person, we have one powerhouse, and we all know that Professor Mohammed is quite knowledgeable about the beginnings of Caribbean feminism, and she has worked in this area. So we want to thank Professor Mohammed up front for giving us the pleasure of hearing her work, and we are indeed honored that she has agreed to do this lecture for us. This series is important to us in many ways. It takes the archives out of just being libraries and present the potential of this collection to you, the members of staff, as well as to our students. So you can find new areas of research and also teach us who take care of the archives what these materials can be used for. Today's lecture is also different in another way. The libraries have always partnered with the Institute of Gender and Development Studies. Now I joined the story late. I came in, I came in, in 2002 and in 2009 we signed a formal agreement with the Institute of Gender Studies to create this making of Caribbean Feminism's collection. But prior to that, we had a number of librarians, and I got and I heard the oral stories of librarians sitting on the tree, under the trees with the gender studies team, or the librarians participating um, in working alongside them. So I want to say that this has been a long process, and this lecture is just a phase in that process. Already, the making of Caribbean feminism collection. We hold inside our collection significant works of women who have made changes in the Caribbean. So for example, we have the papers for the Women and Development Group. We have those papers. We have the papers of Hazel Brown, oral testimonies, including transcripts and tapes of women done over the years by the Gender Studies team. We have digitized early newsletters and photographs of these works. There is already a website which is available and that is manned by the Gender Studies Department where you can see early issues of the one newsletters, cut for papers and so on. So this project is ongoing and we are really grateful for the partnership that has been happening with the Institute of Gender Studies and by the tangible support that we have gotten over the years. So with that, I want to introduce a member of staff from the Gender Studies Department, Dr. Nixon, who is going to chair the session and introduce Professor to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Mohammed, it's an honor to introduce you. Um, so you have a very, very extensive powerhouse bio, so I will do a brief <laughs> of your brief bio. Mm -hmm. Professor Mohammed is a professor of gender and cultural studies and director of the School for Graduate Studies and Research at UWI, St. Augustine, since 2015, a position she also held between 2007 and 2012. 
She's a pioneer in the development of gender studies at the tertiary level in the Anglophone Caribbean and was appointed the first head of the Institute for Gender Development Studies at the UA Mona Unit in Jamaica and served in this capacity variously between 2002 and 2015 at St. Augustine Trinidad campus. From 2004, she was Deputy Dean of Graduate Studies and Research, Faculty of Social Sciences. And she is a pioneer in the second wave feminism, founding member in 1978 of the first second wave feminist organization in Trinidad, Concerned Women for Progress. And she served as a coordinator of, for the first rape crisis center in the Anglophone Caribbean from 1985 to 1987. She's been involved in feminist activism and scholarship for over three decades, and increasingly over the last decade in the field of cultural studies. She is the architect of four national gender policies in the Caribbean, and her academic publications are extensive, namely Gender and Caribbean Development, a special issue of Feminist Review, Rethinking Caribbean Difference, Caribbean Women at the Crossroads, Gender Negotiations Among Indians in Trinidad, 1917 to 1947, and Gendered Realities, Essays in Caribbean Feminist Thought and also imaging the Caribbean culture and visual translation among 100 essays, peer-reviewed, solicited essays, chapters, books, journals, magazines, and newspapers. And finally, to say that she's also the founder and executive editor of the Caribbean Review of Gender Studies, which is the first open access journal online peer-reviewed at the UWI since public, in publication since 2006. So this is very exciting, and we are in very, very good hands to hear about the making of Caribbean Feminisms, which is a project that I heard before I've been here for five years, and I've heard long, long, long about the making of Caribbean Feminisms. So it's a pleasure to introduce Prof. Muhammad, and um, let's start. For gender development studies generally for you know its lunchtime seminar series which are historic now in the university um, and I think they really have been tremendously important never stopping the um, the library without whom we cannot exist as a university um, you know I'm always always tremendously grateful for the library, the kind of commitment from the library, so to Lorraine Nero in particular, um, and his Lorraine, and, um, and for the staff of West Indiana. You know, some of us have made our living off of your, your collection, <laughs> so thank you very much as we continue to build and add to them. Now, I wanted to um, thank you for explaining that I'm not going to talk about the archives as such, all of what I'm saying will lead to what the value of the archives, and I have to bring it around to that. And so I wanted to use this occasion to really um, tell my story, some of the things that I have not written sufficiently, <coughs> put it in a kind of chronological order. And I thought um, this is going to be preserved for the Making of Feminism project anyway, so I wanted to kind of establish it um, in that record. <coughs> even if I never get around to doing it, uh, although I hope I will. 
And the so I want to start with a quote. Um, has anybody read Julian Brandt's The Sense of an Ending? You book. might have seen the film and not read it, but yes, it's absolutely amazing book. But the I like this quote: um, "History is that certainty produced at a point where the imperfections of memory meet the inadequacies of documentation." And to say that, in a sense, at this point, I'm trying to to deal with not yet the imperfections of memory because I haven't gone so far that I've forgotten a lot of the stuff I'm dealing with. Um, but to me that the sense of the inadequ inadequacies of our documentation because we don't have a way of constantly documenting our, you know, our stories but, but leaving records. And so much of what I'm saying in this um, lecture actually can be supplemented with records that I can, that I promise to, to hand over at some point when I'm cleaning my archive. This is what it, some of the things I have, you know, um, albums and all sorts of things that, that will meant that will provide. So, so starting on that point, saying that I'm drawing mainly from memory, plus some of those records, I'm trying to recap that. And I want to to, to, and it is really very personal, if you forgive me, and a personal journey. And I want to start with the ent my entry into um, feminism, as it were, beginning formally and in the academy with the Women Caribbean Project, 1979 to 1982. In 1979, this um, this book I'll explain. What it is, the book of. Um, in 1979, I was a research research assistant, main research fellow for that year, because I joined this project, invited by Professor Justin Messiah, then Dr. Justin Messiah, as director of the Institute for Social and Economic Research then, to become part of this project. Two of us at St. Augustine then were actually dealing with gender in any way. Uh, Mrs. Noma Abdullah, who is now deceased, and myself, I had begun my master's in education in MSc in sociology, doing a thesis um, on education. And sorry, I should have welcomed um, Prof. Burton to this, um, among others, but I do want to recognize Prof. Prof. Burton because she goes back that long with me <laughs> in all of these things. Um, and Bridget, you remember my master's in education, which was like an MS, a, a, a PhD, no, you know, heavy document. And so I was brought into this project, both because I was involved in, fem in feminism and the activist component, which I'll explain later, but also within the academy. So I want to start by saying I've never differentiated and I've never separated my roots. They've always been interlocked in some way. So alongside this, I produced um, this, uh, Joyce Cole was the other writer in this, doc, this uh, publication, which is one aspect of the Women in Caribbean project. And I was invited in 1979 to the first meeting of that project and worked with them until 1982, um, you know, alongside that project. So I was very much part of that project, which is very exciting. I'm not going to talk very much about it other than to say at for the archives, everyone who's involved in gender studies or who, who wants to be with part of the academic growth of feminism, this is central. I have to say that alongside this, and some of the major movers and thinkers in this were um, Justin Messiah, Peggy Anthropos. All of these, Peggy was located in at WAN, which was very much the um, women and development arm, created through Rex Network. So you have these interconnections that are beginning to happen, and that project now begins to take, to find a put it. This was what predated anything like the Women in Development Studies groups and so on, but it would also have been part of the build up towards these groups, because already there was a large project. What was central about this project is that it took on the entire Caribbean and attempted to find a methodology and a way of thinking about the Caribbean. And even though it said women in the, in the Caribbean project, was it very much involved men. I remember Neville Duncan being part of it, and, and a few other men. All right, so the next, so simultaneously, while I was, you know, on the campus 
dealing with women and development studies with that project and so on as a research um, assistant and research fellow. Um, I was also involved in the Concerned Women for Progress, the CWP, which ran from 1978 um, up to about 1982. And I, I pulled out some stuff that you all seen it recently. Mm -hmm. this, this came out of, a, of a, an album that Kathy Shepard, who is a documentalist, had put, put together for me on the, the Concerned Women for Progress, the group, uh, and the group, the second group that we went. So that is a document I need to hand over to you at some point. Original photographs, original clippings, and so on, that came out of that group, the Concerned Women for Progress. Now I have to explain that the Concerned Women for Progress emerged in a very interesting way, in that I was part of a left movement, so socialist feminism, socialist, not the feminism yet. Yeah. Socialists. Um, but I think my socialism must have always been, you know, threaded with feminism along the way. I don't think you, you invent that. These are seeds that are planted very early. And the, that, I can't remember, is it the PPM, if anybody remembers? Michael Ells, and um, at the, it came out of the trade union. Um, the trade union movement, <coughs> Michael Ells' union, which is Bank and General Workers' Union. And there was a, a burgeoning, small, left, leftist group that we all part of. And shall I tell you who was in that group too? Mm -hmm. Wade Mark. So we were all part of this group. Um, fairly strong in the sense there's a lot of trade union support, OWT was down the road and so on. And what they felt is that they needed to have um, a women's arm of that group. So they created, so out of the discussions, they created the Concerned Women for Progress, which myself and Pat Bainu, who was just newly landed from New York, where she was very involved with socialist groups in New York, were part of. So we became the, um, we found it, but we didn't have a kind of hierarchy then. You know, we were, very much part of the movement, but we invited, and there was a lot of other people. Um, Gayatri Paragas was there, I can't remember all the names now, but Rhoda was on doing her field work for her PhD thesis and joined it for the, um, one year while she was there in field work. So some of my photographs actually have Rhoda. I think one or two years she might have been. But she's very much part of that, and the Concerned Women for Progress was a first of its kind. We, we would have had the history of Audrey Jeffers, Nesta Patrick, you know, it was not the invented feminism, clearly. But this is, the, this is in the wake of the second wave feminist movement from 1975 onwards, when there began to be an idea of, you know, the quote-unquote popular burning your bra, women's liberation kind of movement. But as you know, within that, there were streams, and our stream would have been socialist feminists. So CWP became that arm. And interestingly enough, you would have heard Rhoda made this point that at the same time, Jamaica had a similar group which came up with the same, they call themselves sort of Lynette um, Vassal and others, call themselves the Committee of Women for Progress. So we had the same CWP, <laughs> but they were very similar thinking groups and did more or less the same things at that time. So. We celebrated International Women's Day, I think, I don't know what year that was, it might have been 1981. This is Clotel Walcott here, and that's me down in the corner there. I'm saying this is Thelma Henderson there. Thelma is now there, Clotel is there. I'm still here for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I say her clearly, but you know. Um, and we did things, we were very, um, we were very much based on, on, on the issues of labor, very strident, very, but in fact, I would say the group would have been very controversial at the time, the things you were doing. So it would be supporting women on strike, intervening, this one was a tech trainer, you can see for the um, textile trader, textile manufacturing company, a remake of really good eyes. And um, this was a really nice event. 
But in first day, we picketed our beauty show. Oh. And this is the woman in the center, okay. is Cara Bowen. That's um, from, she's in Australia now, Joe. Joe Milho. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't, I have other photographs here, but we all got together, picketed the, um, the beauty at the stadium. So we went there at the entrance and, you know, we enjoyed it. We went and had chicken and chips up. <laughs> but we, we were very much part of that stridency of, of, say, questioning these things. So that was another big event, of course, that was coming. And all of these things used to be very well thought by newspapers. Eh? So this was because they weren't usually known. First, we were, we were the ones who started to have first panels. And public forums and rape, for instance. Rape was not what you spoke about in public. Um, on the succession bill, which then was now being um, passed, um, and rallies, travel, we, we were very much alive with transport and industrial and the Bank and General Workers Union. So whenever we have gatherings, what we have is also the people who, men and women, who come from those. Um, union. So there was a, a, a kind of broad stream, if you like. We produced a newsletter. Um, it was called Women in Struggle. Notice the, you know, the old fashioned way. We didn't have computers and things in it. Everything was done by rolling out, um, what do you call these things again? Stencils. Stencils and usual and everything by hand. And we tried to sell it for 250. Two dollars and fifty cents. I'm sure you never sold it. But anyway, you know, I think I I just take a copy of the library. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So since then, I always deposited stuff in the library. <coughs> then what happened is by 1983, with the with the interesting you know, the fall the the moment of the Grenada Revolution was created crisis within Trinidad. Many of our people, in fact, some of us had gone and worked, not me, but others in the group had gone and worked, men had gone and worked in, um, in Grenada, you know, giving service and so on. And the Grenada Revolution, because of its politics and so on, created a serious crisis in what was left politics. And it actually led to the breakdown and the fissure, the greater, more fissures in left politics at that time. And one of the things that happened is that it, it, it did lead to the demise of um, the group we were in, the socialist group. And to some extent, within the CWP, I think there were different elements. People who were more moving towards a grassroots, um, working women kind of politics, and others who felt that there was a need to, to deal with issues that were um, but we had to contend with the media, like women and in, um, women and consumers, women and um, you know, whole consumerism, you know, the society, women and violence against women. One of the things we actually took up, and you've barely seen it, but that group, we took a long time to find a name, <laughs> and finally, when we arrived at the name, was the group with the O being a sign of a woman under. It doesn't show, it doesn't clear it. So we called ourselves the group, and in this group, another set of, um, the group splintered off into women working for social progress, and um, the group. And it was a kind of, the, if you know your feminist, you know that this is how politics, the political um, tendencies and ideologies gear people into different areas. Sometimes they work with similar goals, but it happens. And so the group was formed. <coughs> And um, it's not going back up. How do you send back up? Right, the most is better. All right, so the group was four. So that's by 1983, right? Keeping you in time. Now, 83, 84, we, we were still in the group. and. I think I just had moved from the ICE and I become the strange enough an economist at the Central Marketing Agents. My first degree was in economics and I was. And then I had got this really nice position um, which was advertised um, globally with, at the University of 
Sussex to work with Kate Young in the first Women, Men and Development Study course at, at, at the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex. That was 1984. And according <coughs> to my mother and father then, who were deeply distinct, I left a perfectly good government job <laughs> that had, you know, entitlement to car and all kinds of things. I went and worked for half a month in at the University of Sussex and, and undertook that. It was like for a year, it was a Commonwealth Secretariat um, funded post. And kind of, you know, there was exchange things that they do. And I went and worked on it. So you can't see it clearly, but um, that's me somewhere there. And, but I was, part, I was made co director of the course by Kate Young because she felt I brought more than, um, you know, a research assistant, even though they had quite wanted a research assistant. And um, what was interesting about this is that it, it provided me with a really global experience because all of this team, it was three months, apart from a year of setting it up, analyzing it, you know, working, teaching in it, being part of coordinating it. I was also exposed to women from all over the world, primarily even then from Africa and the East, you know, and India and so on. But if, but if you live and, and work and live among and with women for three months, you get to know them. And so I think this is a really good experience of beginning to be grounded. This is Kate here. And this is Nan Peacock, if anybody remembers. And there were two persons from the Caribbean, Noreen Pearson. I don't know if her name is Pearson. Yeah, I think it's Noreen Pearson from the, um, Dominica and, and Nan. And there might have been another one. So there were about two Caribbean people. So, yeah. right. So, by 1984, I was back without a job. <laughs> As my parents said. <laughs> and, um, and the... By then, the rape crisis society, they had been truly, what is this Christian um, organization? No, I forgot. They were the end of, Bridget, they were the end of um, that street that comes out into rights and rules. Young, what do you see here? Yeah, YWCA. Yeah, Young Women's Christian Association. Yeah, but not only them, there was another Christian group, forgot the name. But the, um, a lot of people, including social workers and so on, had come together to form what they call a rape crisis society. And they had a committee. And they had decided that it was time that we had a rape crisis center in Trinidad. And I had just come back, and apart from posing for a photographer to get some money once, <laughs> which I don't wear the photographs, I don't want to see it. <laughs> it's not nice, but you know. Um, the, I, you know, I, I I was interviewed for this, and one of, I remember Carla Fodringham was in that group of, um, at the time, and she warned me before not to be too feminist, because this was a group who was not really attuned to feminism, even though they were setting up a rape crisis center, they didn't want to think in terms of the feminism, which they saw as, you know, um, woman hated, man hated, burning, very radical, they wanted, a, it was very much about a social work um, approach and a social work solution to rape crisis. And so I, I became part of setting up the first rape crisis center, and it was the first one in, in the Caribbean, because Peggy convened, Peggy Andrews convened a meeting with me in Barbados, brought me over there to talk to a group of people, which is brought from Jamaica and St. Lucia, wherever, because she wanted, one was trying to facilitate the growth of these things in, in other society. So we were definitely close. Um, one day, when, when I early joined it, very early, and it was a, a little room in the back of the Catholic, in the Catholic Center. You know the Catholic Center on Independence Square? Mm -hmm. And I used to park my car in the back and it would be routinely broken into. <laughs> <laughs> So I was working in the midst of Fort Spain at that time. And we had one room, and um, Asad Mohammed from, if anybody remembers Asad from engineering, um, came over one day with, with carpet and had to be carpeted. And you know, just got people who, who would be supported to build it. And I met Nesta Patrick one day at some event just shortly after. I said, Nesta, 
uh, we need a, a counselor. Would you come and work with me? And Nesta was just going on retirement, I think. Agreed, and Nesta joined. So Nesta and myself, and some people might remember Tina Johnson, if you come across her name, Tina was then, um, she had been a teacher, wasn't teaching her again. And she joined me as also to, to work very part time. We split up salaries and, you know, found ways to work. This was like serious activists work with low, low salaries, but we were building in a repressed center. And it meant a lot of going out, you know, doing a lot of, um, kind of, you know, talking, going to getting these people to publicize things and so on. But very useful work. And, and strangely enough, um, I, I had to do a lot of public um, sessions with, with classrooms and so on. Um, and it worked, I think by the time I left, which I won't give you reasons why I left, but by the time I left, we had already had a firm foot in, and it still exists, and it's still there. It has moved and it's grown. No. Um, so, at the time of our set up the Ray Price Center, um, of course, at this time, the women I I had come back from, from, when I was on my way back from, um, no, actually, like, one of the things that, one of the things that I was supposed to do as part of my return support for the Commonwealth Fellowship to go to Idea Sussex was to replicate something like this in Trinidad and to, to do a similar kind of study course, if you like. And what I did is I wrote, um, I wrote a course, and now this is where Bridget comes in very, very centrally. Bridget, do you remember you and I going up to Jamaica to sit with Lucille May and the Women Development Studies Group, sharing a room and senior common room too? And we um, and I presented that proposal to them, and they accepted it. And um, so I appointed the director of it, and that was the. It was decided that that would be the inaugural seminar of the Women in Development Studies. Not so much a project, but a project to move it into um, curriculum and actual, you know, to, to, to institutionalize it. Because the group itself had been in existence since 1982 with teaching, and I'm not talking a lot about the group because I know the, the, the um, records should actually, the records you have should actually establish it. But the group had been there with many women, Marjorie Thorpe, um, Merle Hodge, Bridget was very central to it. They had started teaching the first introduction to women's studies courses and so on. So all of that was ongoing. So this was moved the kind of more centrally. The project had been funded, the Women Development Studies Project had been funded by the Dutch, the, the um, Netherlands Corporation for Overseas Development. The inaugural seminar was actually funded by the Commonwealth Secretariat. So there's another source of funding. And some with Port Foundation funding. And so this is another project. This is the, the um, it was held on September 7th to 20th, 1986. Facts, guess how it was living. You had to be there again. As you can see, it had a lot of coverage. And if you can read the participants, I'll just read some for you. And I, Stella Bago, who I don't even remember now, Rowida Baxter-Dean, Bridget Burton, Carolyn Cooper, Sonia Qualis, Kathleen Drayton, Elaine Fido, Diane Haler from Belize, H. Noreen John, actually that's the Noreen, from who did the study course in, in the UK. Um, and at night, Ma Maria Kreutzow, I think she was um, Curacao, Laura Ann Monroe was a librarian and in um, Jamaica. Nan Peacock was also done the course. Joan Rollin, you all know Joan Rollin. Uh, Margaret Rose Jones, Imani Tafari Amma, Gwendolyn Williams, Rosina Wiltshire Broadway. So those were some of the names of the first groups and the first participants of that course. And um, this is the participants. Actually, I should have read it though. It's here, I'm going to put a figure for you. But this is Kate Young again, Amrita Chachi from the ISS, who came down to teach um, that section in the book. And this is Lynn Bowles. 
Oh, as you can see, was there from the very beginning. I like doing this because I like us to think about all these people we see, know, and realize that they were part of this early group. And you know, to make that memory. Oh, this is Lucille introducing um, Justin Messiah in the thing we had that little room where the outside became our classroom. Peggy Antrobus, and I think that looks like Marjorie. So oh, looks like Marjorie. Um, this is um, Christine Barrow and myself, and um, Minister in Jamaica now. Maxine. Maxine, thank you. Maxine Henry Wilson. I'm sure that he has been, then he had parts, but this is a bit small. Um, this is Andai, he left, and Sonia Paulitz, and that strange character he left, probably. <laughs> and so that was, I think, was a good. Um, Bridget was there, so she might be able to talk about it. It was, you know, we brought in Norman Gilbert to talk on development, Ralph Henry to talk on other issues. So we, we kind of brought together all the people who were thinking through frameworks that we use for teaching. And again, one of the, when we ended this, there was a lot, there was, because I know how to run budgets like my household. <laughs> There was money left over when I asked Lucille and company if I could produce an uh, edited collection out of it. And got together that, spent a year and a half with Kathy Shepard. And we found a home then. To, during the session of the inaugural seminar, we found a space through the kind support of Selwyn Ryan um, at the end of, at the other side of, um, that would be the so, so, southern side of Isa then, one room, I think we had two rooms, one for my seven Kathy, one for an admin assistant kind of space, and that then became the first rooms that the Institute for Gender Development Studies had, as its first space to, to start a bit from. The Women Development Studies group also had space there. But also of that, we produced this first reader, Gender and Caribbean Development, which you all know, and that was the first incarnation of it, which was done in-house by me, you know, trying to deal with publishing it. So, what I did then, the, the Rape Crisis Center and I parted ways, and, um, and then out of that, as a result of that, they were going to launch into the disciplinary and interdisciplinary seminars. It would be as part of the institutionalization of the Center for Gender and Development Studies. And those seminars were going to take, they were, they were supposed to be three interdisciplinary and about five disciplinary. I can't remember how many, five, I think we had five at that time. Almost matching the faculties in humanities and education, social sciences, um, science and technology, agriculture. I don't think we were doing one in engineering, and I think there might have been one, in, a specific one in education. And, um, and I was appointed regional course director for interdisciplinary and disciplinary seminars in women in the project from 1987 to 1989. And for those, this was again a very exciting period because it meant we were, we were developing these seminars simultaneously. I'd be sitting in one country, but really setting up seminars that had that had begun being set up in different countries. And the first one, 1987, was in Trinidad, I think. Yeah, first one was in Florida. The mm -hmm. second one, um, the record could be put straight from the records. I know that in 1988, we were to go to Jamaica, and guess what happened in that year in Jamaica? Hurricane. What was the name of the hurricane? Gilbert. The morning that Cassie and I were get going on the plane to go up, because we go and spend like about a month there, you know, doing all the groundwork. And, the rain was falling, as we know it can do. And we never got home, and we didn't know what was happening. Of course, they, we, they postponed the entire seminar. It didn't take place until 1989. Because Jamaica had a lot of reconstruction to do. <coughs> but it was part of that um, deal. Now, what was interesting about these seminars is that we were partners with the Dutch. Um, Kerche Liklama, Rene Pitin, Saskia Wieringa, Amrita Chachi, all of them. They would also come down and be resourceful. So apart from 
fourth minute after Waila, we had we were like Puerto Rican. Um, so we had Hispanic, French, other colleagues as well. And it was really, these interdisciplinary seminars are really very important because they brought together a wide range of thinking. So if you think about processing all of these as director of Red Profound, regional course director. It meant that because I wasn't only involved in the logistics, I was, as a, you know, I had to be dealing with logistics of who was arriving and who was, but I would discuss people's presentations with them. I would think um, they would program together with the women, the group that from the particular um, campus, the particular disability group. So I'd re very much be part of this. So, you know, it, it offered me in particular, a really, really good sense of disciplinary, interdisciplinarity, of understanding society, understanding academic, um, you know, knowledge, because they would share knowledge. And, and I think for me in particular, I, I benefited a lot from this experience. And by 1989, I'd been offered a scholarship to the Institute of Social Studies, the beginning. Now, it was offered through the Women Development Center project, but uh, as soon as I went up, it was shifted to a Netherlands government scholarship because they were able to give me a longer period and they had a scholarship in house to give, I guess. And so it was shifted to that one. So I got a scholarship for four years, 1899, five years. And by 1993, when I handed in my thesis and I told her, Shelley Clamo, who is now deceased, you know, I'm really pitying that, you know, it's time I get back to the Caribbean, I have work to do there. Um, Mona had, we had begun to, the, the centers were actually instituted with um, the regional coordinator there was no longer um, Lucille, it was our first professor who was Professor Elsa Lirani, she'd been appointed in 1992, I think, 1992 or um, Cave Hill, in fact, started their center earlier, 93. Um, Rhoda was already located here in this campus, and I knew she'd been working with the group here, so I didn't apply for this post. And I applied for the Jamaica one, and, and I got that post, and so I went straight from Jamaica after stopping in to see my parents and so on and family, and went straight back to Jamaica, and that's where I stayed until 2002, working at that youth. So that's kind of the, um, right. so that's, that's kind of my history in, in, I know it's a kind of strange place to end, but, but it brings me back onto this campus when I then move back to this campus. But one of the things I want to say is um, during the period of building any one of these activities, would have constantly involved public engagement. None of these were ever limited to only the academic, even while we were driving the academic. Um, as you know, setting up a center is always about the engagement with public. So in Jamaica, I got very involved, and I absolutely loved working in Jamaica, and you know, still feel part of my heart is buried there. Um, so, so, you know, the, the idea, I hope that I've been able to give you something of I don't know what I've conveyed to you. I felt it was necessary for me. As some of you may know, I'm retiring at the end of this academic year, and I think I'm beginning to establish, you know, the things I want to leave, the, the records I have to leave, and to do my own stuff take it. And looking at all of it now, um, it was always a lot of work. <laughs> You know, one of the things that you cannot get away from is that it is plenty of work. <laughs> you are on the go all the time. You never, it is very little rest time. But you can see from the production that, that we've, you know, the output of, of gender studies, um, that it was productive work. And I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I thank all of you in this room for listening to me and, you know, sharing in that history. Thank you. that I can ask if we have questions is how, I haven't actually dealt with it because I don't want to keep you longer, I don't have gone over time, um, is how we may make use of these archives. 
So if you have any questions and then we could maybe think through that a bit. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Mohamed. So let's, I'm sure people have questions. So shall we open up right away for questions, please? Well, I can go first and get us started. I was wondering, Prof, if you could talk a little bit about your move to visual. Uh, I was really thinking about it and you know, your amazing work. And um, then the, what's was always striking to me about your work is how you've always kept up with, like, what is the thing that is going to get people interested and motivated to think about, you know, all of the issues we have. And so if you could talk a little bit about your work uh, using video, creating films, and uh, how you see that as a part of your own personal archive, and also how maybe how that fits into the Caribbean Feminism's archive. Thank you, Angelique. Um, I, I came back to this book because the, the matter of working with visuals didn't begin you know, in 1993 or whatever. It was always there. When I was young, um, I was actually um, president of the Union High School and the club to join. I think I did that. I was president of the art club. And, um, but I've always um, painted or photographed, always. It's always been centrally part of what I've seen the world. I remember things a lot more through visual. You know, people remember, people have different mnemonic devices of how to remember things, and my memory is visual. So if I go somewhere in the room, it had a red house there, it had, you know, something there, and that's how I kind of find my way back. Still don't know how to use um, GPS. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but so it was always a very visual memory. And, but <clears throat> so that's the, the, the capacity that I was bringing to it. But the, um, the other, the, the intellectual component of it, the, the, the epistemological component of it, is that I think I think I've always recognized that that what we, even if we speak, words themselves are about images that we build in our heads. And that gender, as a, in reconstructing knowledge and gender, um, we needed to have a vocabulary, a visual vocabulary that we spoke around as well. We need to be able to use the visual centrally. And in gender and Caribbean development, if you go back to the very first this publication, if you go back in, you would see that already had gone wrong to a lot of artists in Trinidad and the Caribbean and Barbados. And their each section is separated by a specifically chosen image that I felt dealt with that, so, with that section. So for instance, I think theoretical framework, I went to Wendy Nanan and I got one of those Venus Imandoff, um, you know that early image of woman. And that was the one that pinpointed that. But history, I went, I got a brilliance. And so there were ways in which I was already thinking through what is the relationship between the visual as we are constructing gender. But the other way I came to it is that when we were doing history, and we talked about the invisibility of women in history, and the way in which records didn't necessarily, written records wouldn't, wouldn't have necessarily um, taking on some of they, they might not might not have coded or recorded some of the things that women were doing. Um, how women were part of any picture. The the other way that I felt you can get at it is through the vision. And I remember going to an exhibition in the Barbados Museum and they had got a set of Thronius and collection. And I, I really looked at them and studied them. And I realized, if you look at this, whether real or imagined, and I know Brunius did a lot of imagination, it was still a sense of how do you read this image? What is it telling you about gender, or class, or race relations, and dress styles, everything? And so it was about pulling that in into the way in which we spoke about the Caribbean. And I think all of that led to a sense of, of wanting to it, it came through gender, alive with visual, but it also came, came up because there's a broader question, I think, 
in the Caribbean that I wanted to deal, which is the way in which we we had been configured in the vision, the way we were represented, and how we how we deconstructed those. If we, we had to have a language to deconstruct that, as well as language that would move us, the visual intelligence to move us away from that into how we how we deliberately constructed our own. And therefore, Image in the Caribbean was part of that. So it's all part of the agenda project. So if you look at the chapters of Image in the Caribbean, it doesn't leave our gender. There's a lot of gender mm -hmm. components in it. You know, the discussion of masculinity and femininity. As, you, as you're threading it through, there is, it is very much a gender text as well. And of course, they were moved into the film because there was so much data collected and so much. Again, the, the idea of if you're going to produce work that was translated at a visual level, you don't want it in another text. It's going to be buried in the text. How many people are going to buy and read them in the Caribbean? So I, you know, all that I created the films, which were um, small narratives from various sections, which is why it is called a different imagination. So it is really <coughs> developing the work like that. Does that answer? Definitely, and those are. I use them in my teaching all the time. They work so well for so many different audiences, and I find it <coughs> an imaging with Caribbean is one of my favorite. Well, I had a very interesting experience yesterday. Mm -hmm. I went to see Dr. Pesha Ramla with Adiola, our student, because she's doing GIS mapping, and we we're talking about cartography and the building of cartography, and then I was telling her he has he does a lot in cartography. Cartography itself had to move has now moved to digital. Mm -hmm. But the chapter in the book map in the West is based on the early cartography, which I had to learn, which actually was the first set of pictures of a space. So I was telling him about it, and he just stopped me, and he went in his bookshelf, pulled it out, he said, he uses it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it was transcendent. Yeah. Of course, um, Pat, thank you so much for your lecture. I, I mean, self-reflection is, is so important as we get older. <laughs> Um, when you were speaking about your work in Trinidad outside academia in the late 70s and 80s, I remember you mentioned Nesta Patrick. Um, I think we have her papers here. Yes. Yes. We yes. 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 Right. What I wanted to ask was, um, what were the relationships like between you and your group, young feminist, young Turks kind of thing, mm -hmm. and the older women's groups? Um, well, Nesta, I know, was always extremely um, open in her thinking, but groups like the Coterie of Social Workers, or the Gender's Group, um, the Seroptimists, those kinds of um, sort of feminist groups, but very different in their ideology and maybe their social class position yeah. from your group. How, how did that go, particularly in the late 70s and 80s? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's a really good question because I think it is... It is so sad that when you when you're young you overlook so many yeah. things and you create these artificial boundaries and barriers and and you know you think you're inventing the world. Yeah. You, 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 always think you have a, you know, young people always think they're going to invent the new, the new solutions. So I think at the time we came on we were the, we were latching on to the North American, the you know, the latest thing and in second wave feminism and um, and so we did not have I can't apart from the trade union and also because we we were in the trade union space the leftist space we tended to to move with that group and I don't remember any major group there may have been and might have slipped my memory but I do not remember making any formal contacts to them. We may have gone to occasions like International Women's Day where we try and get out people, but even at IWV, there would be a particular set of people, you know, the known colleagues, rather than people. Oh, I knew Nesta was, Nesta has always been open. For some reason, I know Nesta. And I always got close, and, you know, got close to her, and, and so, um, so she became, she was very happy to join you. Okay. But, it's a question, very good question. No one is a good example to good something to draw on today. Not to ignore the other groups who you think are backward and so on. 
when I started working with the Rape Crisis Center, well, that is when it looks like a business and professional. Um, those people would then be um, useful allies. So you could kind of see how you, you pull them in. They, and then the social workers and so on. Became more, you had more of a spread. But certainly not with that first set of feminists. The group, the only set of group, people that we allied a lot of were um, media. We got a lot of media women then involved. And the me this was news for them as well, so we gave them copy. You know, so it was a fair exchange. What was the Housewives Association around at that time? They were. They would have been around, and I didn't. I, I knew about them, right. but we didn't get involved with them at all. And I'm, I'm always sorry because I, I think we lost an opportunity to expand what was the range of the kind of feminism that was being nurtured in. And if you think about it seriously, there would have been a different, or maybe a different spin off when the CWP ended. We have spun off into maybe different kinds of groups and created more alliances and coalitions. I do remember that at the Rape Crisis Center, when we had, anybody remember, the clothes for a moment? Yeah. It was very memorable. The, we, that was another moment when we had a really good coalition of yeah. political women, social workers, psychologists church women. I mean, the, the amazing response to that, that um, sexual offense, the clause in that sexual offense, which was potentially so controversial. Um, I remember going to speak at a Rotary Club in, um, what was it, Hilton, not Hilton, it's in front, right, or whatever it is. Right, it's in right. Huge um, thing with only men. And um, trying to convince them and getting a good audience. I mean, actually having them listen. So it was it was a moment of, of again another moment of consciousness raising. I like to say, in the sense. Um, I wanted to ask about that time and the work of the group in. Making public language along with and then um, domestic violence and that. And could you reflect on that process of opening up that space? It's a really public conversation, so you felt that you did not have so a public you conversation. Look at Bridge up in a few. Um, what, one interesting thing is that, you know, I don't think I read any textbooks on violence against them. There may have been. Feminist texts and so on. A, a representative of the Great Crisis Center now. Former representative. But I learned on the hoof, and your question was about how that period rose up, right? And it was interesting that most people would not have wanted to speak about it. Nesta, for instance, pointed out that just when the whole group, the, um, I think the political group, the PNM Women's League, when they went about trying to talk about contraception and sex education, people did not want to talk about it, and rape was in that category. So I think there was no in camera, no sexual offenses bill. Um, it wasn't something you said in public. It was like, not a, a bad word. But it was, you know, one of those words you kept in, you know, in talking closed groups, closed doors, to create a public thing on it. But it was palatable for lawyers and social workers to talk about it, because then they could bring it confined in the law. But I remember going out to school groups, um, church groups, um, what is that place on the Peter Highway? The, so all, so all, you know, all those kinds of organizations. The church, because we were the Catholic Center, so they facilitated a lot. And those provided an opportunity for people to begin to talk. And in small groups, you do get people to talk. One of the earliest things that began to come out to me when I was dealing with um, the school groups was when people would start to talk incest. Because students would not, they would, at that time we had no student counselors and no 
system of dealing that and those kinds of things began to come out because once you raise the issue of sexual abuse in any form fashion that begins to come out so i remember always connecting rape and incest a lot because of the kind of feedback you will get but it was not a I mean, I don't know, how do we use it now? How does rape, when you say rape, is it a, a you know, it's, it's almost acceptable to talk about it, to deal with it, to confront it. It's taken for granted. Just put yourself back 30, how much years? Nearly 40 years, it wasn't, it was nearly 40 years, it wasn't. I find that when the media still sometimes doesn't use it when they should. They like to bury it, you know, they'll, sometimes they'll say sexual assault, but it's always, you know, the passive, a woman was sexually assaulted by a male relative. Were they probably um, afraid of lying? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going <coughs> um, to raise that same thing. I mean, I saw a couple of times um, a man was charged for having sexual intercourse with a child. Can I have sex with a child? No, yes, they have to say that and not rape. Um, I don't say right or really bad when I see Because you're a matter of sex. I have sex. I have So that's something interesting. I still see it. And it depends, of course, on who's covering it. It depends on the newspaper. It depends on the incident. But I see that, that, that scenario a lot. Yeah. Other questions or reflections as we get yeah. to How many? One, only one more question. No, okay. Oh, you're telling me we have to wrap it up. I was like, okay, the boss is telling me we have to wrap it up. We're going to tell you. Well, Mahalo, thank you so much for this presentation um, and just for agreeing to do this with us. But my question is, I was actually reading your article, like Sugary Coffee, um, yesterday because we had to teach it for a class. Um, and I want to I want to ask, given the kind of re-emergence or resurgence of like more like um, a feminist movement within the region, and I know one of your arguments you said like in first and second wave feminism, like this third wave feminism, we didn't necessarily it's more mainstream now. We don't have that kind of political and social consciousness. But given the recent more um, activity around the life and leggings movement, the tambourine army. Um, you know, you Farrell, just those kind of regional movements. Where do you see feminism today in the Caribbean? Yeah, you mustn't take what right to say soon. So I'm thinking out of my experience what would happen. Um, because I think history always surprises us. You know, you never know what is going to, what the future is going to bring. And and I think the, um, the emergence of life in leggings and so on is one manifestation of it. What I think has changed is in notions, and this is what I think I, I went back to in that paper, Pedagogy of Difference, that we started off with a concept of, an early concept, I was almost naive, of sisterhood is powerful, we are sisters under the skin, um, and you know, this is global transformation. And I think we recognize how complex the, the, each of the problems are, or each of the issues are, and what you have is the emergence of interest groups based on different kinds of concerns, and they take up different ones. So life and leggings might be similar to, what is the one in India, or Russia, or somewhere, you know, you have parallels of different kinds of groups holding on to different <coughs> strategies, if you like. But why, why it is no longer the same movement in that sense of the old fashion, the old time one, is um, I think there is a certain amount of mainstreaming at one level. In fact, at most governments, you have a global gender gap, you have a UNDP gender index, you have governments who have being forced to take on gender. You have funders who have to put in a gender component, otherwise you know, they don't get the funding. Uh, to some extent, the mainstreaming is ongoing, and that's another kind of movement. It's almost a public movement and a public strategy to, to either to really be, either because they, are really, they really need to do it, or they have to pay it service. They have, it's a mixture of both. 
the space. And, um, and then you have many, many different ways. So how these might come together, if any, would be the way in which the same, Bridget, the same person Bridget Fraser phrases it. What are the strategies to find alliances between them, if and when they are necessary? Who are your bedfellows when you need to struggle, struggle on a particular um, platform? That, I think, is, is where you might get the emergence of another kind. But I, I but the other way that I have had a third writer, which I took up in, sorry, which I took up in the different paper about the Me Too movement. And this is where I saw the Me Too movement creating what I see as an, is, the, is again the way in which coming back to visual. There's a way in which human society moves with levels of consciousness. We, we do not, have, we operate at a certain level at one point in time and then enough things happen, enough things surface. You have a slave revolution, Haiti. You have um, a civil rights movement in, in America. You know, you have trauma, trauma evidence that would then create another discourse. The world then becomes, gets a cutting fact, and we cannot do this again, we must move to this level. At least progressive people, we're not thinking about trauma. So we kind of, you know, <laughs> moving along those lines. Trauma. And fem the same thing I think is happening to feminism. So what are the layers, and where it is moved, the LGBTI movement, you know, the, the issues around that, um, and the impact of that even on what is what is seen as you know all feminism. So the Me Too movement we created another moment of of um, consciousness connection across the world. And if you look at what little events that happened in India, um, you would Cape Hill, Trinidad, Carnival, and so on, you would see that it's kind of filtered in into ways that we began to think of, okay, how do we handle the question of sex and harassment here? We don't, we don't have a film industry, so we're not going to bring down the, the big boys in film. Um, but, but there's a tackling of it. So that's another way to think of movements as well, not just as concrete, but also consciousness activities that are happening and that are linking people. Because we live in a world that's connected by media, visual technologies that it affords a different moment. Okay, thanks. Another question? Oh, it was an interesting talk to that in Life and Lighting started before Me Too. And so there was a there was a consciousness in the region and then also the whole the discourse around survivor empowerment coming out of the Cambrian armies, which came out of Life and Lighting too. Is something really interesting. And then we have the Leave Shalom campaign here. I'm sure I before that. So just thinking about how consciousness gets raised, um, you know, thinking about that women, I think what's interesting about the feminisms now, because there's so many different ones, is that women are, and different kinds of women, are, are refusing silence, whether it's lesbian and gay and trans women, whether it's poor and working class women, whether it's women living with HIV. Like women are literally saying, no, I'm not, we're not gonna take this, and um, we're speaking out. And it's interesting to think about, you know, popular feminism. People always want to talk about in my classes, like, well, what do you think about Beyonce being a feminist? I'm like, I don't. Right. If she wants to be a feminist. That's great. Like, <laughs> more feminists. That's great. You know, but people get to define what feminism and what feminism mean. Um, you know, how people yeah. are living their politics. Yeah. You know, so it is something really interesting now about how different people have taken it up. It means different things. And, no one, has, no one has to police it, and I think yeah. that's what's really important. It's club you join. Yeah. <laughs> and um, also masculinity. Masculinity is very much part of the feminist movement, whether they like it or not. Yeah. Okay, I think that we can wrap. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much, Paul.